Unfortunately, due to our lack of education or you know proper education, our education is more focused towards um, you know, like I said, this worldly pursuit. That's really the goal. Nobody has a goal of you know anything else. Whereas when we come to you know uh, teachers in the uh, the masjid or Islamic classes, we have a different approach to knowledge. You know, and these this setting is different. It's, it's more sacred and honourable, and you know, it's honourable. It's a higher purpose in life. It's not merely just to give you a skill to go and make money or to go and achieve something uh, worldly. Right, it's really a much higher goal, and these are the foundations for that. So, because we haven't really been through that process, I mean, some of you may well have, Alhamdulillah, you know, those of you signed up may well have studied Islamic subjects and gone to classes on a regular basis, uh, but some of you may be new to this whole concept. Um, so, because of that, you know, almost distance and you know, being far away from the tradition, we find it difficult and we find it somewhat, um, uh, you know, uh, we find it somewhat. Um, hard to grasp you know and then latch on to the um, whole kind of uh, concept here right you know it's uh, it's hard basically <laughs> you know for us to, to, to figure out um, how it's all gonna work um, so yeah so hopefully um, you know you are going to benefit from these classes um, and uh, you know latch on to everything well and confidently and uh, and so forth inshallah ta'ala um so without any further ado we will move into actually you know another uh, introductory remark was the author imam al-sanusi himself rahimahullah ta'ala uh, so i did mention he's one of the great scholars one of the great uh, leading scholars in aqidah uh, but just a little bit about him so i've studied several of his works you may have heard of his name before some of you um, and so forth. Just a quick sort of synopsis of his um, life and who he was and so forth. So Imam al-Sanusi is, is known as an Imam because he's a great scholar. Um, somebody who's, mashallah, very well versed in many of the Islamic sciences. And he led and he authored a lot of works in Aqidah, hence he's known for, for this. He authored about five works in Aqidah and then commented on all five works and several of his works became very well uh, received by the ulama and then commented upon. So the Umm al-Barahin, everyone when we say Aqidah Sanusiya, that's the book it refers to. Umm al-Barahin is just one of the books of Aqidah, the most famous and the most widespread and, and taught book of Aqidah really uh, amongst ulama, amongst scholarship around the world. Uh, Umm al-Barahin is a very, very uh, well received and commenters like maybe, I'm not sure if it's reached hundreds yet, but maybe hundreds of commentaries on the Umm al-Barahin. Um, and Imam Sunusi himself wrote a commentary and upon his commentary there are many marginalia as well so many scholars received this book uh, with a lot of um, uh, you know acceptance and they took it forward by commentating upon it um, he was from modern day Algeria um, a place known as Telimsan many great scholars from Telimsan uh, in Algeria uh, modern day Algeria today um, and he was from the Sanusiya family um, which were you know, around that area in the North African, West African lands. Um, and he was born there, he was raised there, he studied with many of the great scholars there. Uh, he was known for his taqwa, his piety, um, and he became very learned. And he started to teach and started to write works. Um, and he was known for, you know, being distant from this dunya. So he spent, more, he spent his time learning, teaching, uh, writing, authoring works, you know, he was known to be uh, somebody who remembered Allah often and was somebody of great um, worship and uh, dhikr and salutations upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was known for his uh, this attitude. So he was a man of the Akhirah, he was a man of purpose, but at the same time he was a great mind, very intellectual person, not just a worshipper and, you know, sitting in the masjid as an abid, he was an alim as well. And due to his ilm and his knowledge and his foresight as well and seeing uh, there's a need for a discourse in the realm of Aqidah and he wrote in other works in other areas as well um, he wrote in logic and Aqidah and other topics as well um, he started to write books on beliefs and he wrote several of these books uh, he talks about many other subjects as well like spirituality he talks about as well um, so what are these books on Aqidah called he's got I think four books the main books the, the Sughra which means the small one Sughra Sughra the small one the small one the Wusta, the middle one, and the Kubra. So he, he named these books as such, Al-Aqidat Al-Kubra, Al-Aqidat Al-Sughra. And each book has commentaries, each book has 
many scholars that actually took that book and commented upon it. So each book was actually received well. The one I mentioned, which was the son the Umm al-Barahin, that was the most well received and the most uh, taught uh, after his lifetime. He wrote this book we, where we are, we have with us the. Um, so if I show you the Arabic, and this is the book we have. Um, so there you can see the, the Arabic text of the Muqaddimat. So we'll be going through this text on the preliminary discussions, the precursors to Aqidah, inshallah. Ta'ala. He wrote a commentary on this. This is, the, this is the text, there's a commentary on this. And there's actually a marginalia by one of the scholars as well on this book as well. Um, he wrote a books on language. He wrote about um, uh, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, in, 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 as well. Um, and other works. Rahimahullah uh, ta'ala He was, because he was a great scholar, he had many great shayukh And he had many great students as well who carried on his works and his teachings And actually wrote commentaries on his works as well um, And he was in the 9th century AH, so 800s He was he lived around that time He passed away in 895, so this is in the book here 895 AH, we're currently in 1441 AH He passed away in 8... Nine five after Hijrah, end of the ninth century, Hijri, Rahimahullah Taala, wa radiya anhu, and he was, you know, uh, seen off with a great janaza and high respect from the ulama of his time. Um, he was regarded as somebody who was a great loss to the ummah, great loss of knowledge. Uh, many have written in his sort of eulogies and you know in, in, in remembrance of him. And even today we we're studying his book, five hundred years or so or plus later. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, like I said, you know, I've studied a couple of his other books and he's a scholar that's often quoted. Um, and we need scholars, you know, not every Muslim can learn and understand hadith. So we need scholars to tell us about hadith. Not every Muslim can understand and learn the nuances of fiqh and how rulings are made. So we need scholars of fiqh, muftis and so forth. Not every Muslim can study and understand how to defend our faith and the foundations of our faith and the, um, you know, uh, proofs and evidences for Islam and the uh, veracity of the Prophet Sallallahu and the miraculous nature of the Quran and the attributes of Allah and we have scholars Alhamdulillah many great scholars in all fears Alhamdulillah we have nothing to fear as Muslims we have the scholarship we have the knowledge uh, you know great like Imam Ghazali um, Imam Suyuti you know Imam Sanusi is among these Rahimahullah Ta'ala and so we are here today learning his book Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen um, so that's, that's an introduction to Imam Sanusi we mentioned briefly about the book. You will have now access to PDF if I change over to the um, uh, English again, because that's what we're going to cover. I'll read from the Arabic for the blessings of the book, um, but we'll be covering the English, the translation that's been presented for you. And we'll be talking about some of the translation, the words, just to make sure our understanding is correct. Um, and we need you to follow and make notes and ask questions, inshallah ta'ala. So don't be shy to uh, ask questions or um, you know input at any point that you'd uh, like inshallah ta'ala um, so bismillah rahman rahim let's read the text so bismillah i'll put it in front of you as well bismillah rahman rahim sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam qala shaykh al-imam al-alim al-allamatu al-muhaqqiq abu abdillahi muhammadun al-sanusi al-hasani rahimahullah ta'ala wa radhi anhu amin because this is a mukhtasar it's a very short work, it's a matan. One of the concepts we have in the mutun, the basic texts, very, very bare, very, very short, very, very concise, you know, comprehensive, concise wording, um, is brevity. So we don't have this long introduction. Normally commentaries, if you, if you open the commentary of this, you have a whole page on just Alhamdulillah, you know, all praise be to Allah, the raiser of the heavens, the creator of the earth. There'll be long, you know, praise of Allah, citation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and so forth. So there'll be a lot of um, introductory remarks and so forth. This is not that style of text. This is a very basic level where we just say Alhamdulillah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad wa Alaihi Wasallam, and we move into the actual points. This is actually the style of the very basic, basic text. They don't go into long, you know, introductory remarks or uh, uh, what is known as a dibaja. The dibaja is the introductory sort of praise of Allah, the salutation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, uh, kind of uh, you know introductory remarks to the book and the purpose of the, the this book and why that's doing the commentary so in the commentary Imam Sunusi would have said something like as I saw students of sacred knowledge you know struggling in certain areas and 
the foundations to their studies needed a bit of support and help. I designed and authored this book to help them on their studies so that when they begin the journey of seeking sacred knowledge in the field of Aqidah, they have a strong foundation and have no gaps and the things that they learn are and then he would have started his book, right? So these are all comments that the commentary would add on but he just wanted to present the actual things you need to learn. So if we then read on, it says, Alhamdulillah, so Alhamdulillah, Al-Hukmu Isbatu Amrin O Nafyuhu Wa Yanqasimu Ila Thalathati Aqsam So in English, it says, uh, the precursor discussions by Imam Ibn, Muhammad Ibn Yusuf Al-Sanusi Al-Hassani, uh, the Imam and great scholar Imam Muhammad Al-Sanusi Al-Hassani, may Allah have mercy upon him and be pleased with him, said, all praise be to Allah, the Hukam, the ruling verdict judgment is... Isbatu Amrit or Nafyuhu Anhu is establishing an affair or affirming an affair or negating of it. It is categorized into three types. So, first of all, we have to understand the concept of a legal or sorry, a judgment. It could be legal, it could be otherwise. The three categories are coming next. Uh, so, when we say a ruling, a judgment, a verdict is there as well, a hukam in Arabic what hukam is this what was the hukam of this right we can ask in different ways but hukam means ruling right hukam means what is the outcome of you know this what do we do in this situation that actually can be of three categories of course the you know m most commonly used i think most of you would have thought oh is it halal or haram right that's most commonly how hukam is used in terms of everyday language that's on the thick area which is one of the categories however we're not going to be studying that or we will mention that very briefly at the beginning and then just leave it um we're going to be studying the rational judgment, the aqli. We're going to study about doctrine and faith and what we believe in Allah and so forth. So we're going to talk about that much more in detail. And that's what the Akida books talk about in much more detail. The legal, the shari'i rulings, that's in fiqh. So you study usul fiqh, you study fiqh and qawaid fiqhiyah, fiqh principles. That's where you learn about uh, legal ju judgments, right? And the custom is also something we'll be talking about heavily within our studies. I'm just jumping ahead, but let's just step back and talk about um, hukam. So in um, perception of things, in understanding things, there's two levels, okay? Uh, the two levels of understanding something are called tasawwur and tasdiq. And I'm going to get a book that I like. It's called The Trivium by Miriam Joseph. And she has the English. So the problem with this is I've not visited the English terminologies of these things for a while. Um, so do bear with me. Uh, inshallah ta'ala so this is um i don't know if you can see that the um uh trivium of sister maryam i say sister maryam joseph she was a uh um a nun right and a, and a, and a very learned lady uh, and she wrote uh, this book there let's get the light out of there uh, the, the liberal arts of logic grammar and rhetoric so logic is where this kind of stuff is going to be relevant to us uh, grammar is English grammar and rhetoric is English rhetoric, rhetoric. Um, but the logic is very much universal. Aristotelian logic and derivation and common understandings and so forth. So this is something that I'm probably going to use. I don't know if I've got the right pages here, but um, or where I'll find this, um, what I'm looking for. But uh, let's see if I can. Um, so... Um, We'll, we'll talk about it. If I can find English terms for this, it will be great. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll get them later. Um, so, the first level of perception or understanding something is on a uh, individual level where there's no relationship. So, basics, right? Simple uh, understanding, not a connective or relationship understanding. And what does that mean? If I said to you, apple, if I said to you, house, you know, objects, basically, concepts, without any uh, judgment, right? Without any assertions, okay? It's just a concept in of itself. This is, in Arabic, called tasawwur. And in English, I would say perception of something, or perception can be of many things, but you could say something like a concept, right? Not understanding the concept, not a connection or an assertion, but just an, a concept in of itself. Um, so... That's the first level. And you all understood those words, right? We can conceptualize and figure out what man, woman, uh, tall, short. There can be descriptions. They can be uh, objects, red, yellow, blue, right? It can be different things, whether they are a body in itself or a description of a body. But they are singular words, right? In the sense they are, you know, 
uh, singular concepts. Um, that's the first level of perception. That's not a hukam, okay? That's not a judgment. That's just the basic level. That's basically your vocab, right? That's basically terms we have. Terms is a good word. Uh, because remember, we have to come to terms with each other, right? We have to understand terms. If you use a term with me, you know, what does this mean? We'd have to come to terms, right? Uh, that's where it comes from, by the way. Come to terms, I come to an understanding. We understand what a word means. When a word is used in a meaning, it's a term. Uh, when it's used as a ob as a symbol, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, orthography, it's writing, it's spelling, right? So you can look at a word in different ways. Um, so what does it mean? It's the term. What, what, you know, what's the, how is it used? Uh, it's the different impositions to a word, how we, you know, look at a word. Um, so the second level of looking at words now is not just a singular word, but it's to combine words together. When we combine words together, we make judgments. We make judgments. This is where we get the verdict or the, the, the um, ruling from. So when we say, now if I said to you, uh, that an apple is red. I've not just understood the concept of an apple. That's one thing in my mind. That's a tasawwur, you know, concept, conceptualization. I've said I've said red as well. That's a conceptualization. But the fact that I have attributed and affirmed red to an apple is a affirmation of something to something else, which is a verdict, a ruling, a what we call a tasdiq in Arabic. Um, or a assertion. It could be a negation as well. So as you can see then in the, in the definition, it says it could be a negation. So I could say the the apple is not a cube. Yeah. So now again, you understand the meaning of cube. You understand the meaning of an apple, and you now understand the relationship between an apple and the cube shape. It's negated. It's not that. That's not the case. Okay. So this is the basic level of understanding, perception, uh, and how things are related together. Um, I will actually keep that for later. Um, so this is uh, what a judgment is. Now, that judgment that I've been talking about is just everyday things, right? We could talk about it from a mathematical perspective, logical perspective, and so forth, right? So once we've understood what a, a hukam is or a judgment is, we can then start looking at where we get judgments from, what are the source of our judgments. And when we make a judgment, um, how does it come about, okay? So... Let's go into that then. So, as you can say, see, it says it, it, it is categorized into uh, three types. Okay, in terms of the Arabic, it's, if you go further down, it says Right, so three categories: Shar'iyin, um, Adiyin, and Aqliyin, which in English means legal, customary, and rational. So, legal is basically in accordance with the Sharia. Um, there we go. Um, and customary is in accordance with the um, the repetition, as we're going to learn. And rational is rational. So, um, number one, legal. So, in Arabic, it says uh, shari. If, uh, if we go to the Arabic there. So, it says shari here in the Arabic. Uh, the second one is adi, the customary. And the third one is aqli. So, you should be able to see that. Let's go back to the English because that's what we want to do. Um, and how do we get to these rulings? So, first of all, what is the source? It depends on the source of your judgment. So if we can't get to a ruling or a judgment or a verdict except by revelation, except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the sharia, that's a shari ruling. And shari is here translated as legal. Because it could be any law code. For us, it's the sharia of Islam. For the Christians, it'd be the Bible and the, you know, the Torah for the, the Jews. And you know any code of life, really. So even the British law is a form of rulings and verdicts and laws we have to follow but that's based on man-made kind of you know whatever sources they used for us you know so there's that that's the source of a judgment a convention a coming together an agreement or a ruler a, a law giver a law maker which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of the sharia hence is mentioned here as sharia so that study like we said is all about sul fiqh and, and so forth uh, then we could look at things in a different way so let's pass judgments over things in life and around us by way of um, observation. Right, let's look at things. And when we look at things, um, and if the intellect alone can discern things, you know, in other words, we don't need any help from anything else. 
we don't use anything else we just use the intellect alone it's purely rational intellectual kind of approach one plus one equals two right then fantastic you know uh, two is a even number right or we can negate things uh, three is not an even number right so it could be a negation or affirmation again we have concepts and we apply them you know we attribute one to another or negate one from another uh, this concept of odd and even and the concept of a number one two three four five and then we relate them together with words that is a judgment and where did, the, where did that come from it came from rational thought from our minds you know humans have always have developed this understanding it's a god-given faculty right so we use our rationale we use our intellects rational intellectual judgment right um if so that's the third second one right well that's the third one actually we're going to the third one uh, if however we also or we make rulings and judgments and give like you know verdicts um on something so one thing to another by way of not just the aql alone we actually you know if we just had our intellects but nothing else we wouldn't make these judgments but because we've seen repetition takrar and you know one thing happening again and again and again obviously our intellects are involved in this but it's really the repetition and the reoccurrence of something again and again and again in the same way that tells us you know what when there's a fire there's this heat that comes from it and it burns every time i've witnessed a fire there's heat that comes with it so fire and heat what's the relationship between them i'm going to judge i'm going to make a decision i'm going to give a verdict in my life and my understanding that fire burns and every time i see a fire and all that thing there will burn i can judge that burning and i can say fire burns from based on what just the intellect alone so if you had never seen a fire before and you never had the concept of uh you know uh fire burning before you just saw fire and you just saw the act of burning just by way of intellect you could not connect those two things it's because you've seen witnessed mushahada you've seen fire burning fire but you felt it maybe right you've seen that whole process and the damage it can cause and the, the good it can bring as well it can be used in both ways you now have this ability to make a judgment based on the repetition recurrence that's called a customary hukum adi it's the adat it's the repetition it's the habitual judgment we see you see you've eaten food and it gives you satiation you've eaten food and it gives you um nutrition that's what you experienced and repeti- repetition has occurred right you see something heavy fall to the floor right gravity brings things down we are accustomed to these things often they might not happen some happen rare, eh, rarely they might not happen some often might not happen just depends on what kind of connection there is how strong it is uh, and so forth so sometimes food is an issue yes yeah, sometimes food is an issue sometimes fire doesn't burn yes yeah, sometimes fire doesn't burn. there's no logical you know adherence to it's like one plus one must equal two of course it must we can't ever say it must equal three or one but when it comes to must fire burn well we've just witnessed it there's no logical reason beyond witnessing it every time in our lives in our experiences but beyond that experience there's nothing to say it must burn okay and if somebody says i witnessed it not burning it's believable on a rational basis right you might not want to agree with that person because you know you've never experienced it, so you find it hard but that's how that's how things are in life right miraculous things are hard to to accept sometimes but it's not illogical so this is where we have to separate the customary from the rational okay when we go to akida we can't mix these two up it'll be very bad very confusing and very massive mistakes will ensue in terms of our beliefs regarding miracles and prophets and uh, you know and so forth this is highly linked to our beliefs right so we will be going through the customary and the rational judgment in a lot more detail and it's what you need to take further into your akida studies inshallah ta'ala so if we now carry on reading uh, let's uh, I like the arabic is the blessings of imam as-sanusi so he says here فالشرعي هو خطاب الله تعالى المتعلق بافعال المكلفين بالطلب او الاباحه او الوضع لهما ويدخل في الطلب اربعة the translation of that is um, as for the legal ruling it is the directive of allah so the khitab the addressing allah addressing someone or something which is as is mentioned which is connected to the actions addressing us uh, to the action of those responsible mukallafina so with the mukallafs we are given taklif and we have to or we are you know tasked with uh, certain actions either to do them or to refrain from them so it says by requesting requesting something to be done or permitting it so permitting permission is not a request so the request could be to do the request could be to abstain and there's permitting or establishing either of them or there could be certain uh, directives of allah which are not about requesting us or 
uh, permitting us, but they're actually establishing one of the previous two, either of them, either they establish a request or establish a permission, but it's prior to that. The actual request or permission is separate to what is used uh, for them. So it said that in the Arabic as um, uh, وضع إلهما وضع is a form of usul fiqh terminology which is talking about how things are established in rulings, right? Not the rulings themselves. It says وَيَدْخُلُ فِي الطَّلَبِ So it said there is um, by requesting. So what is request? وَيَدْخُلُ فِي الطَّلَبِ أَرْبَعَةٌ In requesting, including requesting, in you know, demanding some an action, i.e. are four things. Because we're not talking about beliefs, we're talking about actions. Because it says to the actions of the believers, right? Actions of the those uh, made responsible. So we've come to we've come to, we're gonna sidetrack a little bit. It's not really a sidetrack, it's part of the book. But it's all about fiqh now, uh, and the concept of rulings and how they work. So uh, and not necessarily the rulings, just the concept of the you know, the kinds of rulings we have and how that works. And by the way, just to make a point here, Imam As Sanusi Rahimahullah Ta'ala was of the Maliki school of fiqh. So he's placed this section on the Sharia and Usul al Fiqh according to the the Maliki school of fiqh, right? He was from that, most of Algeria is from that particular uh, fiqh uh, school of thought. Uh, no, Imam Malik, the Imam of uh, Ahlul Madina, the great uh, lover of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that never used to wear sandals in the city of Prophet وسلم, a great, uh, great Imam of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and you know, following on from him are great scholars um, like uh, Qadi Iyad alayhi, and, and many, so North Africa and Western Africa is full of the Maliki Madhab and many great scholars and awliya uh, from there, Imam Sunusi being one of those great scholars in Awliya as well. So when we go into this detail, it's going to be based on the Maliki school of thought. Just bear that in mind. Um, so it says there are four: Al Ijabu Arbaatun, Al Ijabu, Wal Nadbu, Wal Tahrimu, Wal Karaha. Those are four things which have a demand or a request in them. In English, included in requesting are four things: making necessary, Ijab, recommendation, a Nadb. Prohibiting, prohibition, which is tahrim and dislike, which is karaha. Okay, so there's four things. We're going to define them below. It says, فَالْإِجَابُ طَلَبُ الْفِعْلِ طَلَبًا جَازِمًا كَالْإِيمَانِ بِاللَّهِ وَبِرَسُولِهِ وَكَوَاعِدِ الْإِسْلَامِ الْخَمْسِ Straightforward. There's nothing really difficult about these things at the moment. So what is, um, as for making it necessary, what is it? It is the request of an action. So this is fard, basically, right? Of an action with a firm and decisive request. Such as belief in Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the five pillars of Islam. Um, I don't think there's any complicated about that to really worry um, and talk about this in much more detail. Um, just thinking if there should be anything that's mentioned. Oh yes, one thing that I would add actually here on this point is when we said in the definition, the very first definition of um, it is the directive of Allah which is kept to the actions of those um, uh, of, of the believers, it was a kida as well, so it's connected to our action of the heart. And kida is mentioned there, but it wasn't. Uh, so khitabullah, basically, directive of Allah means what Allah has revealed in the Quran. If you're about what's in the Quran, right? So in the Quran and Sunnah as well, on the tongue of the Prophet Sallallahu that's a directive towards us. So those that address that that discourse towards us can affect us in different ways. One is what is mentioned there. It could tell us to do something or request us or allow us. But also some of the information, the revelation we have doesn't tell us to do anything. It tells us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it tells us about our beliefs. In certain eyes it tells us to believe. It tells us to believe in Allah. But in certain eyes it tells us about Allah. Allah is this, Allah is so and so. Allah ilaha illallah for instance. That's not telling us to do anything. That is saying Allah is one. There's no other God. In some Ayat of the Quran, some of the directives, the address of the Quran and the Sunnah it contains um, Allah's actions, so not his attributes, but what he does. Khaliqu kulli shay, he's the creator of everything. Khalaqa samawati wal arda, he created the heavens and the earth. In some of the um, revelation, we have uh, what Allah will do in the future. So again, related to his actions, but more so to do with objects, like how Allah will make the day of judgment happen and the mountains will crumble and so forth. These are Allah's actions to come this is what Allah is telling you the world is going to occur that's not an action we have to uh, do do something or abstain from something that's not about our actions um, so um, and we also have um, revelation you could go further and further one that comes to mind 
is um, talking about us, not as in our actions, but in ourselves. So again, it's creation of Allah, it really is. But it's basically talking about us and our creation, how Allah made us and took us through stages. We have that in the Quran. Allah has given us details of many things. So what we look at when we talk about the legal ruling is those ayat of the Quran that are directed at our actions or that set up rulings for our actions, right? So we talk about what those that means in a, in a, in a short while, inshallah ta'ala, before um, that we have to go through the four things which are necessary. Um, and the first one we said was um, ijab, which is something which is um, necessary um, and must be done. And that can be both in terms of doing something um, and then the opposite of that would be, as the it was going to mention, uh, not doing something, right? The prohib prohibition. So if we go back to that and it says, as for recommendation, it is the, so what recommendation is a request. It is a request of an action with a non-decisive request, such as the sunnah prayers of Fajr and the like. So in the Arabic, um, we have, um, وَالنَّدْبُ هُوَ طَلَبُ الْفِعْلِ طَلَبًا غَيْرَ جَازِمٍ كَصَلَاةِ الْفَجْرِ وَنَحْوِهَا Okay, just take that further up for you. Um, so, nadab is another word for istihbab or mustahab and so forth, sunnah, etc. Nadab is a level of recommendation. It's a word used. A mandub is used often as well. It is the request. We just read in English. It is uh, the request of an action with a non-decisive request. غير jazim. In other words, you're not required to do it as a must, as an obligation. It's recommended, it's requested, but it's you know highly emphasized. It's emphasized. Such as what? Such as Sunnah prayers of Fajr and the like, right? Such as um, you know, doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reading more Quran, um, you know, doing tasbih, sending salutation to the Prophet. There's a level of obligation, but there's all these extra acts of worship which are mustahab. Right? Praying your sunnah prayers is one of them, fasting nafal fasts, which you could have done today. Those of you who are lazy, may Allah forgive you. Those of you decided, you know, just before Ramadan, let's get a Monday sunnah fasting. Alhamdulillah, fantastic. You got Thursday as well. Please do try to fast on these blessed days before Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, especially if you're regular, keep up these regular beautiful fasts. Um, so that's that's a mustahab or mandub as we call it. And then in the Arabic it says, what tahreem, so haram. It said also a request, but a request to, huwa talabul kaffi anil fi'l. طَلَبًا جَازِمًا كَالْقِرَاءَةِ فِي الرُّكُوعِ وَالسُّجُودِ مَثَلًا Okay, uh, oh, sorry, I jumped. كَالشُرْبِ uh, الْخَمْرِ وَالزِّنَاء وَنَحْوِهَا Right, so in translation of that. As for prohibition, um, it is the requesting to abstain. So we're here just for those of you who are wondering where we are. As for prohibition, it is the requesting to abstain. Uh, from an action in a firm and decisive way such as drinking wine i.e. to stay away from that uh, committing fornication and similar acts so the haram the tahreem comes from a prohibition which is very clear cut and decisive is no go There's no drinking wine no committing fornication no backbiting no lying right so these are clear cut harams and prohibitions in islam um, as for Karaha, well, karaha, he a tolerable kaf and il fi'l also to abstain from doing an action, but talaban ghayra jazimin, that is not a decisive, clear cut, you know, full on prohibition or a request to abstain. Kal qira'ati fi ruku'i wa sujudi mathalan, so there's hadith that tell us we shouldn't recite Quran and uh, uh, in our ruku' and sujud. So as for the dislike, it is uh, the request to abstain from an action in a non decisive way, such as reciting the Quran in bowing. And prostration, right? So to recite the Quran in your ruku and sujood is disliked, is makru, and according to all the scholars, is makru. There's a hadith clearly indicating that. So please be aware of that. Don't um, read Quran in your ruku and sujood, right? This is not somewhere where you should read Quran. The Prophet prohibited that. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Um, and then he says, as for permitting, so we've done the, the we've done. The concept of <clears throat> talab is talab al fi'li or al ibaha. So talab is four things. As for ibaha, he says, Amal ibaha, which is one thing. He says, Fahiya idnu shari fil fi'li wa tarki ma'an min gari tarjihi ahadihi ma'al al akhari kan nikahi wal bayi mathala. Right, so what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> as for permitting, then it is the permission of the legislator, the idhan, the, you know, you've got uh, permission here, it's permitted. Um, 
idhan and ibaha are similar, right? Of the legislator, of the shari, shara, the lawgiver, to do an action, fi'lu shay'in, or tarkuhu, or leaving it, either are the same in the words, without giving predominance, any favor, any, uh, you know, uh, emphasis to either side, to one above the other, I one of the, either leaving or doing, it's equal, it's just mubah, it's allowed, such as marriage, uh, according to Imam Sanusi, it's marriage is a mubah, you don't have to get married, it's not recommended, this is opinion by the way, right, some might say, oh, it's a sunnah, it comes under um, recommendation, yeah, you could say that, so Imam, like I said, Imam Sanusi, Maliki Madhab, they differed over these things, whether nikah is mubah or is sunnah or mustahab, etc. Of course, for somebody in a situation where to be chast, they should get married. But he's talking here about normal, no, re no reason to get married. Well, let's say second marriage. Is second marriage sunnah or mubah? There's a big discussion over that one, by the way, as well. Uh, some scholars said it's sunnah, so get married the second time is recommended. Some said it's mubah, it's allowed. You don't have to, you shouldn't, it's not encouraged. Um, but again, that's normal circumstances. And buying and selling, and buying and selling could be required, but in general, buying and selling is something you can do. You know, talking to your friend about something, about, you know, your studies, just not a conversation. It's mubah. There's nothing for you against you. There's no reward or punishment in either side. So these are mubah things, right? Just examples they're given, right? More detail of that would be in a sul fiqh and how that works uh, and so forth. So that was ibaha. The next thing was wada. So wada, it says... Um, in the Arabic, let's go back to that. It says, well, wadu. So we put things up as signs or as means to lead to other things, or maybe not. So it could be, it, let's see how it works. It says, um, So those five rulings we've just gone through, right, which was um, the four levels of request, which is fard, you know, must do, and then sunnah or mandub. So we had. Um, uh, we had uh, ijab, which wajib. So wajib in the Maliki method is usually used for fard as well, by the way, right? So Hanafis are different in that, but they only have that category. So the fard wajib level, the recommendation level, the haram level, you know, makru tahrim in the Hanafis, and then the just dislike level with no sin, the makru, and then permission, admissibility. Those are five rulings. So the 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 wada for them, the Signs for them, if you like, that's what it says. It says, Ibaratun Nasbi Shari, the Shari putting forward Amara, a sign, for one of the previous rulings. Hukum min tilka al khamsa. What are these three signs or effective factors? A sabab wa shart wal mani. Wa hiya sababu wa shartu wal mani. So in English translation, maybe a bit better here. As for establishing, then it is the expression establishing one of the previous five. I. What is it? It's establishing, it's the expression of the legislator of establishing a sign for a ruling from those five previous rulings, right? We, we understand what five we're referring to, right? Fard, Sunnah or Mandub, Haram, Makru and Mubah or what we'd call permitted. These five have a, um, a reason. They come about in some uh, way, shape or form. So what is the reason of um, them coming forward? How do we get to them? We have Asbab, causes, we have conditions, shurut, and sometimes we have preventive factors that stop it from happening, which is mawani. Okay, these three are general in a sense. There is another one called illa as well, which is more detailed, usul, but it comes with sabab. Illa and sabab are similar and different at the same time. There's, there's overlaps. Um, and you study that in usul, right? But for us, we're going to study basic usul, very basic, basic level and very, very general as well. It's not detailed, um, inshallah ta'ala. And that is the following. Um, so it says um, regarding the first one, which is a suburb. For sababu, what is a suburb? Like what is a shart and what is a, a mani? So we're going to go through these. It says for sababu ma yelzam min wujudihi al wujudu wa min adamihi al adamu li thatihi kazawali shamsi li wujubi al dhuhr, which translates to these signs are first of all a suburb, the cause, the Short, the precondition or the condition, the prerequisite, and the, the mani, which is a plenty factor. As for the cause, right? As for the cause, it is that which dictates the existence of something else if it is present. Okay? So if you've got the suburb, you'll have the musabab, the cause is there, the result, something else being the result, okay? That which is connected to, right? The judgment we're talking about here, right? Uh, and a lack of existence of something else, of the other thing, if it is absent. So you don't have the suburb. You can't have the, the result. So if you have, example, 
the decline of the sun, you've got Zuhr. If you haven't got the decline of the sun, you can't have Zuhr yet. Okay, so right now we've got Zuhr because it's 3 p.m. in the UK. So the the Zawal al-Shams, because Zawal al-Shams has occurred. Now that's the suburb you've got Zuhr. Okay, if that hadn't occurred, which is outside of this time, you haven't got Zuhr yet. So at 11 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock, uh, as you're getting ready for the class or you're doing your stuff, there wasn't Zuhr time. There was no obligation to, there was no suburb for Zuhr. So a lack of suburb, lack of cause, means a lack of the result. The, something else here is the result. And the presence of the cause brings about the result. In of itself, meaning we don't look at preventive factors. Or I don't have to pray because I'm in a coma. Or don't, let's not look at preventive factors. Or I've not got wudu yet. So I, yeah, that's a condition. Don't look at those other things. Just look at the cause by itself. The cause in itself, if it's there, will bring about the you know the concept of obligation of the prayer, the zawal, will bring about the uh, zuhr being fard. Um, and the... Uh, lack of zawal will not in of itself just that concept we're not going to talk, look at every other factor in this you know equation and that's why imam sunusi says in of its in, in and of itself like don't don't ask me the question or what about if this happens that's so soon and that's fake and you know that's, that is a discussion but imam sunusi is just defining a suburb and just letting you know what it is for your benefit right um <clears throat> so what other things are suburb so for instance to have the nisab for zakat right so if you have a certain amount of wealth um, you have to give zakat on it. The suburb is there. Now, of course, there are shurut, which is the hawlan al hawl and all things like this, right? Um, which means the passing of the year um, and, and, and so forth. But for, for, for our concept, we're just going to stick with the basic level of, um, you know, understanding a suburb as this results in that. Okay. Uh, like, for instance, the nikah. What's the suburb of the nikah? The contract, the ijab and qabul. I marry you for this much dowry. Do you accept? Yes, I accept. I'm your wife. I'm your husband. You know, it's all done and dusted. Uh, that's the cause. That's the suburb for the nikah and for, uh, you know, um, uh, the marriage bond and for everything to become halal, etc. So things have causes and effects. And we don't look at other things because there could be preventive factors. Preventive factor could be a mahram. You can't have a marriage with a mahram. Right? Okay, leave that out of the equation. Don't put that sort of preventive factor in there. We're just t t looking at a suburb. And a musabab, the cause and the result. Okay, nikah is a contract which produces the rights of marriage, right? That's it. Simple. Uh, many, many examples can be given. It's just basically the causes for the results. Um, then the next one is the chart. So it says, وَالشَّرْتُ مَا يَلْزَمُ مِنْ عَدَمِهِ الْعَدَمْ وَلَا يَلْزَمْ مِنْ وُجُودِهِ وُجُودٌ So if it's not there, you won't get the result. If it is there, you might not get the result. You might get it. You don't know. ولا يلزم وجوده وجود ولا عدم لذاته كتمام الحول مثلاً لوجوب الزكاة. Okay, so how does that work? It says, as for the prevent uh, precondition, uh, we're here. It is that whose absence dictates the absence of the result of something else. Okay, so if you don't have a condition, you can't have the result. And the example I'm going to give you, different to the example there is. Wudu and Salah, okay, because we just done Salah previously. You're going to now perform Salah. A precondition is to face the Qibla, is to cover your aura. Let's talk about Wudu. It's a precondition, right? So you haven't got Wudu, you can't have Salah. Yeah, so it says there, it's absence, whose absence dictates the absence of something. So absence of Wudu, which is a condition, a precondition, a requisite, prerequisite, results in the absence of something else, which is Salah, which is the result, which is the, what, you, what you want to attain. While it's its presence does not dictate the presence, nor the absence of that other thing in of itself. So meaning, I've got wudu, just got wudu. Does that mean now I've got salah? Well, I've got to pray to do salah, I've got to do ruku, I've got to do sujood, I've got to read the Quran. These are all different things. So if I've done all of them, so don't look at all of them, just look at wudu itself. Just wudu itself doesn't give you salah. No, it doesn't give us salah. So just wudu itself, it doesn't negate salah either. It doesn't mean I haven't got, I can't do a salah. What it means is just having the condition doesn't mean you're going to get the result or you're not going to get the result. It depends on other factors such as takbir and ruku and sujood, etc. But if you have it, you can possibly get the result. But there's definitely the case if you don't have the precondition, you don't have wudu, you can never get the, or purification you want to call it, tayammam. If you don't have wudu or purification, you can never get the prayer. That's correct. You can never pray in that situation. Um, prayer would be, you know, scholars of different would it be forgiven or made up and so forth. But there's no prayer without uh, tahara, right? So tahara is required. The example given here is such as the completion of a year for the obligation of zakat. So the 
cause of giving zakat is the nisab, having a certain amount of wealth, right? The threshold. There's a condition though, and just like in wudu, in prayer, you need to have wudu. In, in zakat, you need to make sure there's a condition is fulfilled, which is the hawalan il hawl, the passing of a lunar year. The hawl here is referring is, is the word for the lunar year, like hawl. Um, hawalan means the passing of the going forth of a, the lunar calendar from one year, one full cycle. Um, whichever day your zakat the day happens to be it could be you know, whenever you acquired the wealth to give zakat right I need to wait a full lunar year now based on like the first of um, you know Rajab is when I got my wealth right next year first of Rajab is a full hole right that's a condition now okay let me look at my wealth what is it you know 10,000 pounds right give 250 pound um, zakat right that's that's 40 uh, 140 or 2.5 percent right that's your zakat alhamdulillah if you've got twenty thousand pound five hundred pound right whatever you've got give your zakat accordingly but you don't give it without the condition being met of the passing of a year uh, on your wealth not the whole wealth but just from the day you acquired it to the day uh, you to the, the year on where and regardless of when you acquired the other wealth right so you might can't say oh i acquired half of it during the year then just like a few weeks before i got another five thousand pound i'm going to keep the out of zakat because i've had it for a year no we put it all together Whatever you acquired during the year, he has passed on the minimum amount, so it's passed on everything. We put it all lumpy all together because it would be practically impossible to track every penny you've got and when you got it and when a year has gone by on it, etc. It's all lumped together, and when it starts, it starts. And when a year has gone by, you calculate it, and every year you calculate, and it averages itself out basically, and you'll pay your zakat, um, and that's it. So that's another topic as well, usul and fiqh, but that's a, a concept of the uh, short. Right, uh, like like you said, wudu for prayer, um, you know, a short for uh, a tawaf, for instance, is uh, wudu as well, or you know, for um, uh, ihram, we're thinking of hajj, um, is uh, the talbiyah. So you can't start the ihram unless you said la bake Allahumma la bake. Right, and niyyah is you know pre prerequisite to many things. Right, so these are conditions. Then being found does it mean you go into the actual thing. So just doing talbiyah right now doesn't make you a muhrim, right? Labaik Allahumma labaik, labaik ala sharika laka labaik. Doesn't make you a muhrim. I just said the talbiyah, right? It's got to be coupled with other things and that are the asbab that result in the actual thing coming about, right? So yes, causes and preconditions have to come together to produce the result sometimes. Yeah, that's the case. And you learn about them in fiqh. But we don't break it down like this. We just learn them. Like we learn wudu, we learn what, how to face the qibla, we learn covering the aura. We don't call them asbab and of shurut etc we just learn them um uh, but obviously we're breaking things down in this book as you can see it's, a, it's very foundational um so then moving on to the the mani so it says well mani uma yalzamu min wujudihi al-adamu wa la yalzam min adamihi wujudun al-adamun li dhatihi kal-haydi li wujubi salah so it's the opposite of short when the short comes you when the short comes you could get the result and um you might not and if there's no short you won't get the result when the mani is there you won't get the result and if it's not there, we don't know, right? So the example given here is um, uh, menstruation for a lady and the salah, the obligation of salah. So um, if the mani, the preventive factor of menstruation is there, there's no salah. You can't pray and fasting as well. But just because it's not there, just because there's no menstruation, doesn't mean there's a prayer. Doesn't mean there's an obligation of prayer necessarily, right? Other factors will introduce that. The lack of a preventive factor doesn't result in the obligation of Salah, okay. Other factors do that. So in of itself, a preventive factor stops the ruling from becoming becoming the case. But it doesn't if it's not there, it doesn't result result in the ruling being or not being there. It, in in of itself, right? Remember that we don't look at other things. We're just looking at uh, the preventive factor as one concept. Uh, another example of that could be, for instance, going to zakat as an example. Could be debt. So debt is a money. So you've got the you know ten thousand pounds. You've had a year that's passed over it. But you borrowed twelve thousand pounds from your dad, from your brother, so you've got a debt, a de obviously a debt that covers your zakat, right? It's called a, a, a dainul muhit, a, a dain which a, a debt which uh, takes away all your wealth, puts in the minus basically, or below the nisab. So you're a minus two thousand. So you've fulfilled the cause, uh, you which is the suburb, which is the threshold. You fulfill the short, which is the hawlan al hawl. But guess what? You got a debt, right? That's a money, a, a big enough debt to wipe away your wealth. So now you don't have to give zakat. So if the money is there, which is a big debt, uh, what they call the, the, the 
the encompassing debt, not just a small. If you've got if you've got a debt of a thousand or two thousand, it's going to reduce your zakat, not take it away. If you've got a debt which is so big it takes away, it minuses all your wealth, then you are no longer zakat. You actually can take zakat. Right? If you're in minus, you're actually poor. Right? You need to pay your debts off. Right? You take you can take zakat, believe it or not. Um, so that's the ruling here. It takes away zakat. Right? So the money, the preventive factor, if it's there, it'll take away the ruling. So it'll stop zakat being obligatory on you. Uh, it'll stop the prayer becoming a blue lady in that situation and so forth. Uh, things like um uh Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad um illness is a mani for fasting. So if you're gonna harm yourself by fasting, you know, you're gonna become so ill and so uh, uh you know could kill yourself or give yourself serious health uh, injuries or harms, that's a preventive factor. You can't fast, you're allowed to fast. Why? Marad is a is a man here right model being illness severe illness is a is a preventive factor so that's just usul okay uh, and that's that's it basically for the usul <laughs> we won't carry on with that and then we have one of the most amazing discussions on um akida basically and it's the hukam adi this concept of repetition fire burning food satiating you know things that happen in life and how they're connected and what we believe about them and this is really really important this section uh, and i hope you all join me tomorrow to continue this section walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen